Hello everyone and welcome again to another online uh, worship service. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, these online services won't have to continue much longer and that we'll soon be able to gather again in person. So please do pray for that. It would be great to be able to get opened in May as soon as we can and uh, meet together again for worship. Uh, we have a little bit more freedom now, um, able to travel a wee bit further and uh, meet up for walks and things like that. So if anyone uh, wants to meet for a walk and a chat, I'd love to do that. I'll happily come to you and uh, walk uh, with you and uh, chat to you. And uh, if you want to do that, just send me a wee text or a message and we can uh, meet up. Um, encourage you to just uh, keep on hanging in there and persevering forward as we continue to trust God for his uh, uh, purposes and life to be in us and with us uh, in the days uh, uh, to come. We're going to gather and worship our great mighty God this morning. And so we're going to uh, join together in praise this uh, song, um, His Mercy Is More. What love could remember no wrongs we have done Omniscience all knowing he counts not their sum Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore Our sins they are many, his mercy is more Praise the Lord, his mercy is more As we constantly roam What Father so tender Is calling us home He welcomes the weakest The vilest, the poor Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more He lavished on us His blood was the payment His life was the cost We stood neath the debt We could never afford Our sins, they are many His mercy is born Praise the Lord His mercy is born His mercy is more. His mercies are new every day. We have so much to be thankful and grateful for. Let's uh, come to prayer. Um, I thought I would use the um, ACTS model of prayer this morning in our service. 
um, a reminder just of the wee videos that I put together in prayer that you can still use. They're still on the website and the Facebook page, etc., etc. Um, you still have them on your phones, hopefully. Um, so do go back and, and make use of those prayer aids maybe in the week ahead. But we're going to, we're going to come before God in prayer. Let's pray. And let's begin our prayers with just lifting our eyes and worship, lift our eyes to see the greatness, the goodness, the wonder of God. We've just been singing about his mercy. Father, we thank you for your incredible mercy that is new every day, for your incredible love and goodness and faithfulness. We've just celebrated Easter a reminder of your wonderful love expressed in your Son, Jesus. Father, we just want to worship you, worship your Son, worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Declare that you are just and perfect, righteous, loving, generous, good, and kind. We thank you for your mercy. And let's come and confess our sins. Lord, we have just shared together in that song, our sins, they are many. Father, we examine our hearts and our thoughts and our lives and our deeds. And we see some of our brokenness. Father, we pray that you would forgive us Forgive us for when we speak words that should not be spoken, when we don't speak words that should be spoken. Forgive us when we think thoughts that are not from you. Forgive us for when we do things or fail to do things, things that would bring you pleasure and delight. Father, our sins are many. But we thank you that your mercy is more. And so we do thank you. We thank you for your grace, your forgiveness. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for the many blessings that we've enjoyed this week. For the many good gifts and wonderful things for, for the spring sunshine. For the beauty of this place in which we live. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, all of it coming from your hand. And Father, we come before you not just with worship and praise and adoration on our lips, but also desires and needs and wants in our hearts and on our tongues. Father, we thank you that we can ask you, our loving Heavenly Father, for your help, for your strength, we ask for you to lead us and help us in these challenging days. Lord, we pray that you would hear us now as we bring different individuals that we know, different members of our church family before you who have specific needs. Father, we just ask that you would hear our prayers, that you would draw close. As we continue to worship, we pray that you would just lead us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just want to... Um, start a new series this morning that we're going to be using for the next uh, while as we go forward online and hopefully then in person. I'm going to call it Living Life, um, thinking about, um, about life. Um, Presbyterian Herald was out there recently and this is a picture that uh, struck my, uh, I took my attention just as I was, I was reading through an article um, uh, an article about a church in Belfast reaching out to, to skaters in their local community. And one of the quotes that was taken there, you have it on the picture, 
One thing emerging from many conversations is a sense of hopelessness. I want them to know that in Jesus they can have life and have it to the full. The minister picking up the the sense of hopelessness for these young people in life, and then him with the desire to offer life in Jesus, life in all its fullness. You know, I firmly believe that. I I believe that there is a a sense of lostness and and lost uh, nature of life at the minute. And I think this is a really good time for us to think about life. A good time to think about life because we've been learning lessons about what is important in our lives. We've been learning lessons about what to value. It's a good time to think about life because uh, we've lots of choices to make in the next months and years as we we look to sort of uh, restructure life again and what we do and don't do and how we prioritize and what we prioritize. So it's a really good time to think about life. I also think it's a crucial thing for us to think about spiritually. We use that idea of Jesus, you know, Jesus brings life and gives eternal life and we can have life to the full. And I wonder sometimes, do we have any idea what any of that really means? What does it mean to have life to the full? That's the kind of thing we're going to be thinking about in uh, the weeks and months ahead. We're going to, to use Matthew Matthew's Gospel, largely from the Sermon on the Mount. Here's a short video I want you just to watch for a minute. This series is going to be an invitation to to take off the blindfolds and truly see what life is and what life is meant to be and how life is meant to be lived. And my prayer for you and for me, for all of us together, that Jesus would just open our eyes, that we would see life and know life and know it to the fullness. All the the fullness that he can bring to us. So I hope you pray that along with me. Jesus, open my eyes to life. Let's read um, from God's word as we uh, turn to it now. We're going to uh, read from Matthew chapter 4, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7. But before we get there, we're going to, to look at sort of the, the build up to that and the, the beginning of Jesus' ministry and what um, Matthew really focuses on and, and leads us to uh, as we think about living life. So this is from verse 12. Jesus has uh, been baptized. He has been uh, tempted in the wilderness. And now he's beginning sort of his public ministry. Verse 12 of Matthew 4, God's word. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light, On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Amen. And we thank God for his words. We've all been living 
life in lockdown. And we've done that now for uh, a large part of the last year and it has affected all of us in different ways. I wonder what you have learned or, or what you have felt or what you've experienced. How has, has the, the last year of life been for you? Uh, I have my own personal experience talking to, to different uh, friends, family. Some of you, we've, we've talked to bits and pieces about how you have experienced it. I think the general sense seems to be that there's been things that we've really enjoyed and benefited from less demands, more time, a simpler way to, to actually think about what matters and what doesn't matter. Some of those things have been really good for us. Other things have been really difficult, haven't they? The frustrations and the limitations, the, the missing particularly of people, family, of friends, of, of fellow believers to worship together, freedom to just go out and do something that we want to do. So the ups and downs of the last year have led us to, to reflect on things that are important and to reflect on things that we personally value and treasure. And now we're hopefully heading back towards some kind of normal life, but what will that be like? How will we live in the next few months, in the next year, in the next five years? Lots of things will continue to change, no doubt, and there'll be lots of things that we don't foresee. But I want you to think about how you want to live your life. Where do you want to spend your time and your energy? What do you want to do? What do you want to not do? What will you have to do? When we're thinking about life and how to live it. Where do we go to for guidance? Where do we go to for, for our priorities? Where do we go to to really um, find the core crucial things? What is it that we really want? I'm guessing these are some of the things that, that we want from life. If I, we were to ask you or I go down at the street and ask other people, what would they say? They want to be happy, successful. They want to have meaning and purpose. Maybe they want to be healthy and enjoy life. They want to enjoy and be happy with family and friends. These are the kinds of things that really matter to us as people, aren't they? I wonder, is such a life possible? Is it happy to have all of these things in life? And would it be good to have all of these things in life? What is it that we truly need? What is it that fills our, our soul and our spirit and, and with joy and pleasure and delight? What is it that truly makes us feel fulfilled in life and where do we find that? Maybe Google has all the answers, does it? Maybe we could find the, the key thing that will make us feel happy and delighted and satisfied. It seems to be that many people continue to search for this uh, human need for, for life, for, for what life is meant to be, for all of these things that we've sort of very briefly touched on there in the last couple of minutes. And sometimes we think out there, the answer is out there somewhere. If I can get the right thing, the right, the right person, the right circumstances, the right whatever, if I can just get that and find that, that will satisfy. Often we also think that the answer must just come from what's inside us. So we're encouraged all the time, you know, to, to grasp life and to live life to the full, you know, just find something that, that's you and, and you know, pursue it, you know, find the, uh, just enjoy the things that you want to do. And, and that's one of the great temptations at the minute, isn't it? That, that when we have this freedom again to, to move and do what we want to do, what is it that we really want to invest our time and our energy and our money and whatever else in? Is it enough to simply follow our feelings and our desires and our heart? 
C.S. Lewis says this. He says, all that we can, um, all that we call human history, money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empire, slavery, is a long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. The whole of human history, pursuing what? The reason why it can never succeed in this, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol and it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn or the foods our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. Very simple analogy that he makes that uh, just as a car needs petrol or a car needs diesel, so our lives need God. We're created to, to burn life that comes from God. He is the fuel that we flourish on. And being part of a fallen, broken human race means that we often think the answers lie elsewhere. We often pursue and and spend all our life and all our energy pursuing all kinds of things. So maybe to remind ourselves at the very beginning of this series that life comes from God. Life is designed by God. And the life that you and I need and deep down crave is actually the life that God created us to have and to live. And so what the gospel does, what the good news does is point us to life. And that's what Matthew does. Here in Matthew 4, we're pointed to this person, Jesus. Uh, One of the lines that struck me as I was reading this this passage and and preparing uh, my thoughts around life was, Matthew just simply writes that Jesus went to live in Capernaum. He lived in Capernaum. Matthew points us to this human being who went to live in this village, a a reasonably uh, large village, um, but in a very backwater kind of place. And the, the area around Galilee where Jesus does most of his work and ministry, not the center of the world by any stretch of the imagination. Capernaum is the place where Peter lives, Jesus probably spent quite a bit of time in his his house there. But the point that Matthew's making is Jesus lived life there. He lived as a human being in this ordinary village among ordinary people doing ordinary things. Where does life lie? Look to this man who lived in this village. He went to live in Capernaum. And then what Matthew does is he quotes from Isaiah. He quotes this prophecy about the the one who will come, the Messiah, and he focuses on the great event that is taking place in this man coming to live in Capernaum. People walking in darkness have seen a great light. The light dawning on those who live in the the shadow of darkness. This person who's come to live here is a dawning light. He is the one who has come to bring light into the darkness. Here is a source of life that is going to to shine out into the whole world, not just for these people in this village, not just even for the, the Jewish nation, but right out to the Gentiles is where that prophecy takes us. This person, Matthew says, is a really, really significant person because his life shows how to live. His life is all about proper life for all of creation. John's gospel puts it like this. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. It's John's summary, basically, of that prophecy. In him, this man living in Capernaum, was life. 
And that life was the light of all. Do you believe that? Do you believe that life, the key to life, the key to your happiness, your success, your prosperity, your blessedness, do you believe that the key to all of that is found in this person, Jesus? I do. And I want to encourage you that that's what the scripture teaches us. That's the one that they point us to, Jesus. And so in him was life. He's come from the Father. He's the one who, who was there with the Father. John says, you know, we, John 1 verse 4, think of what comes before that. The word was with God. The word was God. And then the word comes into our world. The experience of all of eternity brought into this life. And this life then lived out in, in this human experience, this human village. Shining for us to see. And this man that calls us. As Matthew introduces us, he says, this is what Jesus began to say, repent, turn around. I'm going to look at that. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is right here. Heaven and earth are right here together. Jesus is saying that, that as you watch me live in Capernaum, as you watch and listen to me, you see heaven and earth come together. The kingdom of heaven, the place where God rules and reigns is here, at hand, among us, with us, Jesus says. This is why Jesus is crucial. This is why Jesus is the key. He is the one who brings heaven and earth together. He is the one who brings eternity and our ordinary human life together. He is the door that connects us to all of the life that God has. He is the, the one that can bring this water that wells up to eternal life. He is the one who can bring life in its fullness because he has life in its fullness. And so Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full, to have it abundantly. Do you believe that Jesus is crucial and key well, you accept that if you want everything that life has to offer, the place to find it is in the person of Jesus. Sin blinds us to that truth. That's why Jesus calls us to repent, because human beings continually go other places and look for other things, either from inside us or around us, and we think that will satisfy, that will be the answer. Matthew in the gospel invites us to, to take off the blindfold and look to the light. See the light. Look at this man who came to live in Capernaum. Learn from him. Follow him. The rest of this morning, I simply want to try and convince you and show you and help you think about how Jesus has so much to teach us about life and what Jesus has to teach us about life. This is a man called Dallas Willard. Um, he died a while back. Um, uh, one of my favorite writers and authors, he has a superb grasp of Jesus and his teaching and a wonderful life of, of holy, humble following of Jesus. And I've learned so much from, from his books and his writing. And what I want to do is just quote some of the things um, that I read from one of his introductions in this uh, whole Sermon on the Mount. And, and what he does is he, he helps us think and see about the life of the Father and the life of Jesus and why they're so important. So here he's talking about pointing us to, first of all, the, the God, the, the source of life. And one of the things we often do with God is we make him distant or dull or boring or unknowable, unfathomable. Jesus knew God. Jesus knows everything about God. 
So let me read this first of all. We should think first that God leads a very interesting life and that he is full of joy. Is God interesting? Of course he is. He's the most interesting, joyous being. Undoubtedly, he is the most joyous being in the whole universe. All the good and beautiful things from which we occasionally drink, tiny droplets of soul-exhilarating joy, God continually experiences in all their breadth and depth and riches. We experience tiny drops of joy sometimes in life. Where does that joy come from? Well, that joy is created by God, the God who created all things. The God, the being who experiences everything fully, totally, all of the time. The most joyous being in the universe. So when Jesus lives his life, he knows that incredible, wondrous, eternal joy that the Father and him have shared. And when we watch Jesus live on earth, what do we see? We see a, a man with joy. Truly full of the joy of life. One of the most outstanding features of Jesus' personality was the, an abundance of joy. He was well known to those around him as a happy man. His steady happiness was not ruled out by experience of sorrow and even grief. You think of all the, the trauma and the difficulty that Jesus was going to encounter. The, the harsh, difficult conditions of his world and his life. And yet, you just read the gospel stories and you know he was a man that people loved to be around. He was a man who, who enjoyed life and was full of, he was happy. He had the key to happiness. Beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we have the Beatitudes, blessed are, blessed are. And Jesus says, these are the ones who are blessed. Some of the translations take that as, you know, happy are. Jesus knew and knows the secret to human happiness, human joy, because he knows more about that than, than I do. He knows what the Father knows. He shared what the Father has. In him we find happiness and joy. And we find love. One of the, the great things that we crave and need that fill us and make life crucially, wonderfully brilliant. What Dallas Willard says, the Heavenly Father cherishes the earth and each being upon it. The fondness, the endearment, the unstinting regard of how God towards his, all his creatures is the natural overflow of what he is to his core, which we vainly try to capture with our tired old word, love. And we talk so lightly about the love of God. There, Dallas tries to, to bring it to life, doesn't he? The Father who cherishes each part of earth, each, each being with fondness, endearment, unstinting regard. Why does he do that? Because it's the natural overflow of who he is. That love that flows out of his being, his nature, that flows widely to every single being and part of creation. That's the love that Jesus knows. That's the love that fills Jesus. That's the love that Jesus brings into this world. That's the love of Jesus that shares with this world. That's the love that we see in the gospel stories as Jesus meets these individuals and these people. That's the love that we see, that we love in Jesus. You want to know how to love and how to, to be loved. You want to know what, what love is. Where do we find that? We find that in Jesus. God is love. Jesus is God. For Jesus, heaven is at hand. What Dallas Willard says, heaven is never thought of as far away. It is always right here at hand. Heaven is here and God is here because God and his spiritual agents act here and are occasionally available here, are constantly available here. 
for most of us, heaven seems to be a very distant place, doesn't it? It's the place away somewhere out there where we go to at some stage. Jesus never lived like that. Jesus said, heaven is here. The kingdom of God is here. Somehow Jesus said this connection with the Father that seemed to, to breach heaven and earth and bring the two together. And as Jesus lived his life, you never got the sense other than that moment on the cross when he said, Father, what, you know, why have you forsaken me? That's the only time we ever see Jesus distant from the Father as he takes the, the weight of sin upon himself. The rest of the time, this incredible man has this constant interaction with the Father that is just so simple and so straightforward and so easy. And it brings such power to his life. Jesus can do incredible things. Jesus always can say the right things and, and, and has the right answers for the most difficult of questions. People are amazed at his power and his wisdom. Why? Because all of heaven is with him. All of everything is with him. You want to know how to live with power, with spiritual life and fullness, Jesus models it and shows it and brings it to us. Jesus brings the assurance that our universe is a perfectly safe place to be. You ever feel perfectly safe? Hasn't that been one of the difficulties of the last year where so many of us seem to have lived with this constant fear and worry and struggle and anxiety? And then you read Jesus' words, you know, uh, why do you worry about food and clothes? And you think, how can we possibly not worry about... What you find in Jesus is this man who is so connected with the Father, so connected with, with heaven, has so much of the, the Father's true life in him that he is perfectly at ease at every moment. Even in the face of huge challenge and huge opposition, Jesus knows that he is perfectly safe because he's in the, the Father's hands. Even when he's going to, to the cross, and remember in the Garden of Gethsemane where his, his whole being is fighting the, the horror that is to come, Jesus says, I'm going to trust your will because I know in your will that is the safe place to be. Do not be afraid. How often did Jesus have to say that to his disciples? How often did he show his disciples that, you know, when God's with you, there's nothing to be afraid of. And God is always with you. The logical, the, the, the certainty of that for Jesus shows that he is the place where we can find perfect peace. I do not give you peace as the world does. I give you a different type of peace. I bring you a, an eternal security, a security that cannot be shaken. Would you not love that? Do you not want that in your life? Those are just some of the things about life that we, we long for and we need that Jesus has, that Jesus lived, that Jesus brings to us. Jesus is not just nice, he is brilliant. He is the smartest man who ever lived. He is now supervising the entire course of world history while simultaneously preparing the rest of the universe for our future role in it. He always has the best information on everything and on the things that matter most in human life. That is an incredible statement to make about this man who came to live in Capernaum. This man who lived, died in his early 30s. He was crucified. Dallas Willard says that this man is the, the smartest, the most brilliant man who's ever lived. This man has the key to life. 
This man holds life, supervising the entire course of history, preparing all of the universe for our future. Look at that last line. He always has the best information on everything and on the things that matter most in human life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. I have life. In him is life. Where do we find life? Where do you seek life? Where do you seek wisdom and direction? Where do you seek fulfillment and and joy and peace? Where do you find it? The answer, the answer the gospel gives is in Jesus. He is the life. And so he invites us to turn around and follow him. We're going to look at that. He invites us and and invites us to a, a journey into life, a journey into eternal life. Are you on that journey? Are you committed? focused, pursuing? Are you looking and seeking life that is found in Jesus? And all the confusion, the hopelessness, the lostness, the brokenness, the many, many, many voices Only Jesus, only Jesus has life. And so I invite you to come. Come to him. Surrender to him. Give your life to him. And walk with him. Walk into the fullness of life. Let's pray together. Father, would you just open our eyes that we would see you and see Jesus? Would we see your joy and your your love and your pleasure? Would we see and glimpse your your control and your your power, your glory? And Father, would you help us when we feel as if we're we're caught up in a, a whirlwind of chaos, would you help us to live our lives focused on you, committed to you? Teach us how to be disciples of life. Would you bring life into our hearts. And so, Father, we do pray that as we begin this series, that your word would just lead us forward, deeper, into that overflowing, abundant life. And as your people, as we gather together this morning, We join to pray that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, um, pointing us to those words from John's Gospel. You're the word of God the Father from before the world began.
And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and in the week ahead and forevermore. Amen. God bless.